This is Plugged In in 2023. Con Edison's podcast on everything and anything about energy and what we all can do to get a clean energy future. It's summertime and the living is, well, busy, at least for electric utilities. It's the time of year when energy companies face the greatest threats for outages and equipment failures due to heat waves, hurricanes in some regions, fires in others, and good old climate change in general. That's what we will talk about today on Plugged In, Con Edison's podcast about everything about energy. I'm your host, Philip O'Brien. Joining us is Con Edison's Vice President of Manhattan Electric Operations, Lisa Primeggia. We'll also hear from Con Edison's Director of Emergency Preparedness and our meteorologist for a complete look at summer 2023. A big hello to Lisa Primeggia. Welcome, Lisa. Hi, Philip. Welcome. Let's start with a look at the United States, and then we can narrow it into our own service region in New York. Two-thirds of North America could face blackouts over the next few months as summer heat increases demand for electricity. That's the latest from the North American Electric Reliability Corporation, which releases regular assessments of grid, grid conditions. NERC says huge sections of the U.S. from the whole West Coast through the Southwest, Midwest, Texas, parts of the South and New England face a, quote, elevated risk of energy shortfalls. NERC doesn't say big outages are a certainty, but they say climate change and other factors raise many red flags. Noticeably absent from the report is a dire mention of New York. So, Lisa, what are some of the reasons why New York may do better? Well, Philip, to start, Con Edison has invested over $2.4 billion, that's right, billion dollars in our electric de- delivery system. That's actually a record for us. You know, we invest in our system really to ensure reliable, continuous service for our customers, especially during those summer hot months. And what we found is that this approach really does work. You know, Con Edison has consistently been ranked one of the most reliable utilities in the world. In 2022, as a matter of fact, we were ranked 99.9% for reliability against our peers. Pretty incredible. This is a real testament to the the Con Edison employees. The women and the men that work here, we really are focused in delivering reliable service to our customers, especially on those hot, long summer days. But you know what? It's not just Con Ed and it's not just our employees. Our customers are amazing. They're really doing everything that they can do to help us meet our clean energy goals. You know, we've reached several key milestones uh, over this past year or so. We've connected more than 55,000 solar projects with the combined capacity to produce 500 megawatts in New York City and Westchester County. Our small and medium-sized businesses, they're saving too. They've saved more than 1 million megawatts of power. This may be some of the reasons why New York's not listed as one of those areas that is in trouble or may be in trouble for customer outages this summer. But you know what, Phil, let's face it. This is New York and Westchester County. This is the largest city in the country. We have a 24-7 lifestyle. Anything that happens here becomes world news. We have a complex transit system. There's all kinds of cultural institutions and events, emergency agencies and services, and really so many people call New York City and Westchester County home. It is crucial for us to keep them in power at all times, and especially on those days when they need it most. Hold on a moment, Lisa. Let's find out just what kind of forecast is expected for New York this summer. Joining us is one of Con Edison's meteorologists, Jessica Potashinchuk. Hi, Jess. We've had a mild winter this year, so tell us how is the summer forecast shaping up for the Con Edison region? Yeah, so it was a little bit of a weird winter, right? We barely had any snow. We barely had any cold. Had a few episodes of extreme cold, but overall, you know, it was the second warmest winter that we've ever had. And so now the question is, is that trend going to continue as we head into the summer months? What are we expecting? And the answer is no, we're going to be seeing a little bit of a pattern flip here. We're going from what's called a La Nina pattern, which actually refers to cold waters over the Pacific Ocean, 
And we're going to be switching things over officially now. And El Nino is in place. And typically, what that would mean for us is a summer that's going to be a little bit cooler than what is normal. And a summer also, it's going to be a little bit wetter than what is normal. So fingers crossed that that's going to mean a little bit less impact on the grid, perhaps less heat waves, less 90 degree days, all things that we're going to keep our fingers crossed here as we go into the next couple months. And La Nina and El Nino are those two little troublesome kids that pop up. Isn't that so? Yeah, definitely. I mean, it, we keep track of them, we forecast them, and they have a big implication too when it comes on things like hurricanes and tropical storms. Jessica, what can you tell us about that hurricane season that's already started? What do you predict? And is it any different than NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration? So our forecasts are pretty similar, not exactly the same, but they're pretty similar. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that we're transitioning out of that La Nina pattern, which typically means a more active tropical season to an El Nino forecast period, which means typically we're going to see a little bit quieter conditions. During El Nino years, there's a lot more wind shear, stronger winds in the Atlantic, and that kind of prevents a lot of hurricanes and tropical storms from developing in the first place. So with that, NOAA is actually predicting that this year we're going to see a near normal hurricane season. By the way, you mentioned we're already in it, June 1st through November 30th. That's the official hurricane season. And NOAA is predicting anywhere from about 12 to 17 named storms, five to nine of which they're expecting to become hurricanes. And one to four of those could be major hurricanes. Our forecast is a little bit more on the lower side here. We're forecasting 10 tropical storms, three hurricanes, and forecasting two of those three hurricanes to become major hurricanes. Also want to pass along that our confidence in this forecast is moderate, just because again, there's a stronger correlation here when it comes to El Nino and quieter years. So again, similar to the summer forecast, we're going to keep our fingers crossed that stays true, and hopefully we'll see what Mother Nature has in store for us. Good to know. Thanks, Jess. Back to Lisa. Let's talk some more about reliability. What are some of the infrastructure steps Con Edison has to protect the electric distribution system? Well, our system has many redundancies. So really what that means is if any component or piece of equipment fails, we have an alternate or a backup that will then serve us customers, which that ensures continuous service. Our customers shouldn't even know that we've had one piece of equipment fail. We're also constantly evaluating and assessing the performance of our system. We look at every piece of equipment, and we do this at least annually, and we look at the age of the equipment, how does that equipment perform, what is the current demand on our system, and what are we forecasting in the future? So we'll look five, ten years down the road to see, well, what will our system look like then? We then take all of that information, and we look at our investment dollars, and what we'll do then is target our spend in those areas where we need it most. Okay, so then tell us some of the methods you use to find those trouble spots. So, you know, Phil, prior to summer, really fall and spring, it's all about preparing for summer, right? So one of the methods that we use is infrared photography. So what the infrared photography will show us, if a particular component is heating up, it'll turn red and we'll know that there's an issue there. And that heat or that red is an indicator that that piece of equipment is, could fail in the future, possibly resulting in a customer outage. So since we do that in the off season or what's considered our off season, it allows us to make the repair prior to the summer period. And you know, once we're in the summer, we're already prepared, our equipment's ready to go. The summer is all about response. It's about rapid response, effective and efficient response to any possible incident that occurs on the system. But actually when we're in the heat event, there are several you know, levers that we can pull to ensure reliable service. Um, we can reduce voltage on the system, and that will take stress off of equipment. We also have crews that will actually go out and cool our underground transformers with water uh, to ensure that they don't fail. We're also going to implement, uh, use, utilize our advanced metering infrastructure, or more plainly said, smart meter technology, to shut off the flow of power in a targeted way to our customers. So what does that mean, right? First of all, let's be clear. That's a last resort. That won't be our first go-to should we be in the middle of an incident this summer, right? But in certain situations, if we're able to shut the power off to targeted subsets of customers, we could actually 
reduce the impact or the potential of a greater loss of customers on our system. How we do this, we take it very seriously. Um, we have our engineering team. They will perform analysis. They will look, again, at the current state of the system. Where are we now? They will look at what is the worst case scenario that if we lose a particular piece of equipment, what will happen? They'll look at that worst case scenario and see are there overloads, are there issues, how can we alleviate those issues? And if we've tried all of our more traditional methods to alleviate those overloads and that doesn't seem to be working, we will then look at this smart meter technology and we can actually select particular customers, maybe a couple customers on a block or on a corner or what have you, and we will actually disconnect them from our system. So before everybody gets nervous that we're going to be shutting off customers, let's be clear on a few things. There's a few ground rules here, right? First of all, it's residential customers only. It will not impact small or any commercial customer. It's important that we keep those businesses in service for public safety. You want to have a grocery store. You want to have your pharmacies in service. We also will not be disconnecting any known life-sustaining equipment customers. So if we know that you have an oxygen machine or something like that in your home, and we're aware of that, we will not disconnect you. And finally, critical customers, right? We just said how important New York City is. Hospitals, transit, nursing homes. Critical customers will also not be disconnected in these scenarios. Lisa, I'm so glad you pointed out that we're not only responsible about when we might turn off customers deliberately, but that it points to the technology is so precise that it can actually leave out one and do another for a, a better good. True, Philip. I mean, I've been in Con Edison for many years, too many to say here on this podcast, but this is a real true innovation and something that we've been waiting for for a long time. And we really we can't wait to see the benefits uh, in serving our customers during the summer. That's all very important info, Lisa. Let's talk now about how Con Edison prepares for severe weather and widespread outages and how the company responds to those conditions. Joining us is Deanne Ostrowski, Director of Emergency Preparedness. Hi, Dee. Hello. We know that hot weather, hot humid weather, and the resulting heavy electric usage puts a, a, a big strain on electrical equipment. And we work all year round to upgrade and replace equipment to meet those demands of climate change. But what you do is an additional type of preparation. Can you tell us what you're responsible for? Sure. So one of the most important things that we do is to make sure our company is ready to respond to any type of emergency that could occur. That could be on the electric, gas, steam, cyber, physical threat, you name it. In this case, I'll focus on severe weather and widespread outages, as mentioned. So the climate is changing. Not only is the weather changing, but the expectation to get our customers back in lights quicker has changed considerably. So we owe it to our customers to get them back in power safely and quickly, because they deserve our best. We need to make sure that we have the processes, the people, the materials, and technology needed and ready to respond. So how do we do this? We conduct drills, in each region, we do it company-wide. We wanna make sure that everyone is operating from the same playbook. We use real-life scenarios to test, to sharpen, to improve our skills, to drive readiness. We conduct training whenever and wherever needed. And there's a lot of new people that are in different roles throughout the company. So we wanna make sure that knowledge transfer is occurring and our teams are comfortable and confident. Can I ask you something about these drills? Could you? set the table for one of them for us? Is it like really everybody gets together and there's a scenario and do you, do you throw curveballs at people? So absolutely. We do everything from having the initial weather forecast that we have Jess and our meteorologist give us. We go through the scenarios where each region is telling us how they prepare for the storm that might be coming in. We pretend that the storm hits, we give uh, each player a scenario of what happened during the storm, what effects it has, um, how it's affecting our community. And we go through and um, we throw scenarios at each individual who has a role within the storm drill to assess their proficiency. That's really interesting. And when I make sure that people understand the process, I'm not only referring to our own employees, but I'm also talking about our external par partners. Um, this could be the Public Service Commission, New York City, City Emergency Management, the Fire Department, Police Department, um, municipalities in Westchester, or other utility partners. 
We have open lines of communication, we build trust, and we maintain solid relationships with these partners because it's absolutely crucial. So we meet with our partners on a continuous basis throughout the year. We train them on our system, on our processes, and we also invite them to participate in our drills and exercises. We also have mutual aid contracts established to make available additional crews when needed. Over the years that we learned when a storm comes up the coast, resources within the area can be depleted by neighboring utilities who also may be affected by the same storm. So resources further out like the west coast most likely aren't impacted by the same weather patterns. So a few years ago, we established a fly-in program at our Pomona facility. There we have approximately 100 vehicles all gassed up and ready to go with tools, equipments for our flying crews. This program allows us to have access to additional resources and saves a considerable amount of travel time, allowing for the crews to get in the field quicker. How, how does it work? The crews fly in from another part of the country at, at our invitation and they can go to this center and boom, ready to go, a truck, all gassed up, equipment, tools, and off you go to wherever there's damage. Is that the idea? Correct. We reach out to resources who may be in areas who weren't affected by the storms. We request for them to come in, so they bring in certain safety equipment that is personal to them uh, with the crews. We fly them in, we bust them up to our Pomona facility, and there, there are utility trucks ready, gassed up, equipment, anything that they may need to put the customers back in lights. We put them on those trucks and they're ready to go out in the field. What if they came with their own trucks? Is, is the idea here to save time? The idea is to save time. So if you were to get a crew up from Texas or even out from the West Coast, there's a lot of travel time involved, and it may take several days for the crews to get in. Meantime, those customers remain out of power because of the damage. Correct. And if the crews fly in, we can have them on the airplane and in our facility in less than 24 hours. Okay. So tell me now, why is it called mutual aid? It's called mutual aid because we return the favor, whether it's a utility out west or one of our neighboring utilities in the northeast, if we can share our crews with them or they can share our crews with us or our materials, we do so because it's our goal, whether it's the utility in Massachusetts or the utility in California, to all get our customers back in line. And one hand helps the other and it keeps everybody in power or returned to power in as quick and as safe a way. Correct. So we've already seen a lot of success in this program and we have ordered an additional 150 trucks that will be coming in the next couple of years. So in total we'll have about 250 trucks which gives us the ability to support approximately 500 flying crews. D, all of that involves a lot of a lot of uh, hard wire stuff, tools, trucks, equipment. Is there a technological side to this, a high-tech side? Absolutely, and that's another aspect that makes this position so interesting. Uh, there's isn't a finish line when it comes to emergency preparedness. So lessons learned, new technology, and benchmarking with other utilities always is generating ideas for continuous improvement that we work on with our partners throughout the year. So this can be anything like using technology to decrease onboarding times for our mutual aid crews, that are coming in to using things like text messaging to proactively communicate with our customers. So text messaging can be used to inform customers that we are preparing for an event, to stay away from downed wires, to let our LSE customers know that a storm is coming in and they need to be prepared. What's LSE? LSE is a life-sustaining equipment customer. So that's a customer who needs equipment in order to... Someone on an air intake machine or something like that? It could be, yes. Okay. Uh, text messages can also uh, include things to, for safety purposes, to stay away from down wires and to even give our customers an estimated time that their power will be restored. D, we've talked a lot about all the preparation, the training, the material, the equipment that emergency preparedness puts into their job. Is there, is there a single goal in mind for everybody? Yeah. In the end, our ultimate goal is to get our customers back in lights or back in power safely and quickly. Okay, great. Thanks so much for being with us today. Thank you so much for having me. You're
You're listening to Plugged In, Con Edison's podcast about energy and what we all can do towards a clean energy future. Please follow us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, and LinkedIn. Our handle is at Con Edison. Now let's return to today's episode. We're talking about summer 2023 and how Con Edison is preparing for severe weather affecting the electric grid. Let's return to Lisa Promegia. Tell us how climate change plays into building a reliable electric distribution system. So climate change is everywhere. You can't avoid articles or reports on climate change and what the impact of climate change is. You know, one of the things that we've learned or that we hear often about is that climate change is going to make extreme weather events more frequent and more severe. So this will put definitely an additional strain on our system if you think back to Hurricane Sandy, for example. Yeah. Um, so we, we are investing quite a bit of money to make our equipment more resilient. So that's submersible uh, technologies or flood proofing, selective undergrounding, ways that we will be able to withstand a storm better than we have in the past. Um, but climate change also goes hand in hand with clean energy, right? So we want to get to that clean energy future to either slow down or lessen the impact of climate change on our system. So we're obviously investing a lot of money in the clean energy space. So we just completed a very exciting project in time for this summer. We built a transmission line in the borough of Queens. It's about six miles long. And this line is intended to handle more capacity that we've discussed that we need during the summer. Um, This line also will now allow for the retirement of an inefficient polluting generation resource. You know, during the summer, we have heat waves. There could be multiple days, but there may be a few days in there that are really warm, really hot, right? We call those peak days. So on those peak days, to meet that extra demand, we have generation assets that are connected to our system that we don't own. They're operated by a vendor, Uh right? They're older generation gas turbines. They use fossil fuels. They are meant to meet that peak demand. That is specifically what they're used for and they operate only on those peak days. With this project and two others that we have planned, one in Brooklyn and one in Staten Island, these peaker plants are gonna be coming closer to their end. These are just some of the ways that we're investing in clean energy and climate change and resiliency. We have many projects in the hopper um, that we're looking at on the distribution side and on the transmission side that will help Con Edison move forward its clean energy commitment and also help New York State meet its clean energy targets, which are pretty aggressive. Tell us some more, Lisa, about the company's clean energy commitment. So we're committed to being leaders in the delivery of clean energy. Uh, We are all in on clean energy. You'll hear that quite a bit. Um, We're doing that by investing, building, and operating a more reliable and resilient system. We're also really looking to advance the electrification of heating and transportation. Now, when I say transportation, that means your car at home, Philip, Mm -hmm. all the way to, let's say, a bus fleet for the MTA, right? So we're looking to electrify the transportation, I guess you could call sector. Um, We really want to aggressively transfer away or transition away from fossil fuels by 2050. Okay, so that brings up a point about severe weather including heat waves when when the peak rises and the concept of electrification, getting all devices running by electricity instead of an internal combustion engine or a gas stove, et cetera, things like that. Given that we're never going to be completely able to avoid severe weather and, and outages that might go with them, should customers be wary about adopting these new technologies like electric heat pumps and electric vehicles? Absolutely not. Let's just be clear. Electrification of buildings and transportation is critical to meeting New York's clean energy and climate goals. It, it, it's a must. So what I would say to these customers is do not be afraid of the technology. You should explore the technology. We want a clean environment for the future. You should definitely look to employ it where you can. And and it is true. It is going to create more demand on our system. That's without a doubt. But that's our job, right? We need to look at what is that forecast? What is that going to look like? Where are we going to be? If everybody in this neighborhood electrifies their home and they all have electric vehicles, what does that do to the demand and the strain on our system? That's our job. We need to do that analysis. 
we need to invest properly, and we need to be prepared for that load to come online. And we also need to partner with our customers that if a customer comes to me and tells me they want to electrify an entire office building, I need to be able to do that for them, and I need to meet their service date. It needs to be timely. We need to be efficient. And it's really about partnering with the customers to move this forward. But electrification and electric vehicles, that is the way of the future. Lisa, another point. Uh, We talk a lot about renewables as being the new source of electricity. That means uh, solar and wind. But if the sun ain't shining and the wind isn't blowing, what do we do? What happens then? Yeah, it's tricky, Philip, isn't it? So I think renewables are great, but you're right. The renewables won't work unless we have a way to store that energy for those times when the wind isn't blowing and the sun isn't shining. So Con Edison is committed to installing 1,000 megawatts of battery storage by 2030. So we're all in on the storage game as well. Lisa, as a final thought, where can our listeners find out more about programs and incentives through Con Edison? There's so much information. I guess what I really would point the customers to, coned.com, our website, they can learn about how do you save money on energy costs now? What incentives do we have for electric vehicles or charging. You could also read about our clean energy commitment. There's a lot of great information on that website, and I would encourage our customers to go there. Thanks to our guests, Lisa Primegia, Vice President of Manhattan Electric Operations, Deanne Ostrowski, Director of Emergency Preparedness, and meteorologist Jess Passenschuk. And thanks to you, our listeners. I'm Philip O'Brien. Until next time, stay plugged in. And that's our show. If you have comments or questions, please email us at podcast at coned.com. That's P-O-D-C-A-S-T at coned.com. We'd love to hear from you. Let's be engaged. Let's learn more. And most of all, let's stay plugged in. <laughs>